Welcome to Growing Tech with Greg Williamson and Owen Scott. Today we're with Grant Ryan. He's a serial entrepreneur. Actually, a whole list of companies Grant's been involved in Global Brain, Real Contacts, SLI Systems, Eurexta, Yike Bike, PurePod. So, we've got a lot to cover today. What we're going to sort of dig into today is how Grant got into tech, uh, maybe some of what are the key challenges he sees for you know, Kiwi exporting tech companies. And then we're going to talk about growth and look at the major constraints uh, around that area. Right, great. Welcome along, Grant. Good to have you here. Nice to be with you, boys. Kia ora. I suppose right. the first thing is really to, to start at the start. And you've got a—I mean, you're obviously from Southland, and you've got a bit of a inventing um, gene in the in the family, really, haven't you? Do you want to tell us a little bit about your your, your sort of background in, in that regard? Yeah, my father was a chicken farmer. And we grew up with a machine in our garage that looked like something out of Dr. Zeus with machine, went up and position. I just assumed everyone had one of those in their garage. But <laughs> um, So we kind of grew up assuming that you could invent things and send them around. The, the, the thing he was, that machine made these plastic lamb covers that you put on day old lambs. So when a nice Southland Southerly came through, you didn't have all your lambs die. And so I always thought, man, it'd be cool to be an inventor. And when I was at high school, when you do your end of year yearbook, they say, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, inventor. And they said, you've got to put something serious. And I was like, I am serious. I didn't know how to do it, but I thought that'd be kind of cool. And so you, was your dad uh, self-taught in terms of all his uh, yeah. Yeah, mechanical capabilities and, and yeah. things? Yeah, and he did something that I've always done, which is find lots of other clever, clever people to do the hard bits. So. Because it is, um, we'll, we'll, we might talk about your brother a bit later on, but the you know it's a family thing as well. Like your brother obviously was a successful entrepreneur as well. Yeah, yeah. All all, all of my brothers have had su- successful entrepreneurial yeah. streaks. Not not quite as much as others, but you know, they're, they're trying hard. I, I, I say that just to tease them because they <laughs> they do the same to me. I know they would. <laughs> One little trivia fact is that uh, my dad was a customer of your dad. With, oh. the, with the land covers. Oh, really? Like so, so. <laughs> good oh, South okay. Otago farm. I can remember those. So probably, yeah, what one one aspect of invention mm-hmm. is always um, being successful with, with the innovation too. So I suppose that's another... Because people can invent all kinds of stuff and tinker around in their garage, but there's another thing about creating things that well, actually that have an impact, isn't there? Yeah, well, being inventors is a weird thing to tell people because... One of the most likely reactions is they'll start telling you what they've invented and they'll offer to give it to you for free and you can build it and give them half the money. And it's kind of funny, it's like a lot of people think they can sing and they can sing a few songs, but actually to do invention properly is actually bloody hard work, Mm. which is why I've kind of don't do as much anymore because it really is hard but um yeah there's a lot to it and and um but it's it's an awful lot of fun as well so yeah. Well, you go. well, where did you, you know, so where did you, um, so he's obviously started, you know, born south, and where did you sort of start your career? Where did you move on to from there? Uh, so I did a engineering degree, mechanical engineering, because that was as close as I thought I could get to being an inventor. Um, I was going to do architecture, but wasn't artistic enough. And then I got drifted into, I did a postgrad in ecological economics, which is just because I was interested in it. And um, yeah, had a proper job for a couple of years before I had my first idea. And your, because then that first career step was actually, was a, the DSIR, which is now a, yeah. um, a Crown Research Institute, isn't it? So that, I mean, that would have been, was that a challenge for a entrepreneur or inventing minded person? Or, it wasn't. Or did, you, did you learn some good stuff as well? Oh, you know, I, I learned a lot because, you know, when you come out of university, you're pretty raw. And so, yeah, learn. Lot, I mean, you always learn lots of things, um, but I don't think I could have been a career scientist. I sometimes call myself a failed scientist. So, and why is that? Uh, because I I couldn't do a career as a scientist. I think it would have done me. I, I like to. Th- there's a role for everyone, and it wasn't really for me writing papers and things. I, there's quite a difference between science and engineering. I'm more of an engineer inventor. They're both yeah. valuable things, but yeah. Yeah. So your first invention was Global Brain? Yes. How did that all come about? So for the young folk, if you can remember pre-Google days, this was before Google when I was just a user of search engines and you'd type something in 
and you guys are old enough to know that you used to get a whole lot of spam people would you know put and I thought well why can't you just observe if someone types something in and someone clicks on something why can't you then use that to learn and improve it and then um, and then that formed the basis of our idea for a search engine and um, you know the first, but the other thing that people don't really explain to you about the whole entrepreneurial thing is how much luck's involved. So when I started that, it was just pre the dot com boom, and no one knew what a dot com boom was because it hadn't <laughs> happened. Yeah. Now I kind of, you know, so the environment was just ripe for something like that, and it's not always the case when you have an idea, and sometimes you can be a bit early, a bit late, and there's no way of knowing that when you start. So I got lucky with my first one that meant I could do a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Yeah, so there is a bit of, um, there's obviously luck. Uh, there's insight, which you, you had in that, but there's also a bit of courage, is there, to just oh, t- take a take a punt on, on your idea? Because, you know. Yeah, there is courage. And, yeah. and, I mean, most people don't get lucky because they don't have a crack. But I also had a, a family, and my father in particular said, if you guys ever have an idea, I'll back you I'll pay your mortgage, have a crack. And not everyone has that, so you've got to be lucky yeah. with that regard as well. So, mm. like, you sort of come up with this idea. Like, how did it sort of, I mean, obviously it's, you know, how did it sort of become, I suppose, a product, and then obviously you, you sold it to someone. Like, yeah. how did you figure out that whole thing? Uh, so, the basically, I, I, I look back at some of the stuff we did, and it's just mind-bogglingly... <laughs> Uh, naive like we our first trip to the Silicon Valley we had overhead projections if you can believe that and I mean they're just I hope this wasn't the set we took because the slide on intellectual property um, had intellectual spelt in, incorrectly <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a gifted speller neither is my father um, but basically the best advice I got was to just go and talk to a whole lot of people and they'll give you some advice and other people will give you advice so you know I talked to some of the old stores around, you know, the Christchurch scene, and they would put you on to someone, they'd put you on to someone else. And that whole process of just, I basically became obsessed with it. I had this thing called paid holidays, which was so novel to me that I'd get paid for holidays, use them all up. And, and then I remember sitting on a telephone call to a guy who wrote a search engine newsletter in the UK. He was kind of the expert, and I explained to him what we were doing. And when he said, yeah, this sounds really kind of interesting. I thought, well, okay, maybe we'll have a crack. So, yeah. So you were, you were sort of straight out of the bat trying to sell the technology to someone, you know, rather yeah. than sort of, you know, like get a bunch of customers yourself. Yeah, so that's the thing that you also learn pretty quickly. I thought, oh, it's a good idea. I'll sell the idea. Ends up no one wants an idea. They want a product that works. And then you end up building a product that works and actually people don't yeah. want a product that works, they actually want a team that can deliver. And so it's actually probably pretty hard to sell an idea without a product that does mm. something. And then there's typically a team that does all the things that make it actually work. So yeah. you've almost got to do that extra amount before you can actually sell it. Or, you know, or you know, I didn't, I didn't intend to build a company, um, but it's kind of what you have to do if you do innovation. Mm. And that's why I kind of like just focusing on doing the innovative bit because I'm not really a natural entrepreneur. I'm a natural inventor, I think. But I kind of did the entrepreneurial part because you had to. Mm. To yeah. get it going. Yeah. And what was that like? I mean, that was it's probably a, a bit more normal for Kiwis to be up in Silicon Valley doing stuff now. But back in the day, it would have been, um, did they... Yeah. Oh. How did they respond to you when you sort of turned up with your acetates and overheads and started pitching well, the stuff? Overheads was the technology back then. Mm. It was a while ago. Um, but yeah, I think we got some meetings because they were curious that these guys had come from New Zealand. But yeah, it was um, it was definitely the the whole th- thing was smoke and mirrors because it was one desktop on my um, kitchen table and and we managed to do this multi-million dollar licensing deal with a big player in the US and the it all kind of the biggest um, crumbling moment was when they th- wanted to come to New Zealand to you know just do a celebratory see thing the operation. and see the operation <laughs> I was like oh, I don't think we'll do that <laughs> um, but yeah you just um, you dive into it with out really knowing what you're doing and then you just try and get as much information as you can and then just follow your mm. nose really 
do you think yeah, um you know is there more of that now or less of that or you know is there a bigger leap now or you know because it was obviously a big courage because you're sort of one of the you know, we call it a pioneer well, going over doing that well it, i think um it's just everyone's doing it in bigger leaps like when we oh, sold our first company you know in the tens of millions it was stocked didn't get all the cash whatever but you know that was a big story that they wanted to do whereas yeah. now there's a couple of co- companies in Christchurch have sold for over a billion dollars mm-hmm. that most people have never heard of yeah. <laughs> so everyone's just doing yeah. things at way bigger scale than what you know I did when I started but mm-hmm. it was kind of you know when the first com- tech companies were sold for 20 million dollars they're like oh you know selling the crown jewels of New Zealand tech and it was like that wouldn't even get a, yeah. an article now. Yeah. The, the tech industry is one of the most underrated success stories in New Zealand. I mean, it's mm. overtaken, you know, sheep. And it's now the third biggest exporter, and there's no friction to it. It's just going to keep growing. And mm. they, you know, some commentators are surprised. They're like, oh, it's grown at 18% again this year. And you're like, well, yeah. why wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, it, it can grow, you know, spectacularly. Yeah. And there's other really cool things about the tech sector, really. And what do you what do you reckon are the um, what are the constraints for us to because tech could you know conceivably as you say it could be the biggest industry that we have it will be I can't yeah. see how it can't not be just because the others are physically constrained and this one isn't I mean we've seen with tourism yes. that we can't keep growing forever we know we can't put more cows yeah. on another two whereas there's no limit to having more sequence and Rocket Labs and all sorts of things. Mm. I, I, and I, I like Rocket Lab because it's another example. I used to say, well, New Zealand should focus on tech that we can do here, so we're not going to have a rocket company. But actually, there's some massive advantages to doing that here, like clear skies with no other mm. planes and a nimble government. And yeah, um, so I don't see any limits really to the tech scene because basically the world's short of um, really cool places to live like New Zealand. <laughs> Mm. And these people can do anything from anywhere, and so you've got all sorts of people doing yeah. weird and amazing things. So, I'm what do you think of the? I mean, what are the challenges that, that a tech company would face now? Do you think that's different to the a tech company, you know, when you started? Uh, well, it was interesting when I started. Uh, one of the things I got involved in, I was a founding director of the New Zealand Venture Investment Fund that set up the mm. first seed funds and and seed investing. And everyone was like, there's just no access to capital and there's no access to talent. And um, someone showed me a, a survey that said, that's the top two issues in every country in the world. <laughs> everyone complains about not having enough money and not having enough talent. Um, but the access to capital now is so much better than it used to be. And if you look at those two constraints, I'm always kind of like, um, either, like the talent one's more interesting It's because it's like either... The talent doesn't exist to do what you need to do or someone else has worked out a better proposition for the talent mm. which is and your job as an entrepreneur is to you know it, not do something that's impossible or do something where you can afford to pay the people who are best at it mm. so it's kind of a yeah. a non thing you've got to think about that like you're not going to set up a ski field on port hills and complain it snows it doesn't snow because you know or you know you've got to try and that's your job as an entrepreneur to work out what the constraints mm. are and how you can do it. And yeah, yeah, and that could be one of the one of the things that uh, technology entrepreneurs need to do here is is make those that career path, those jobs, more and more attractive to Kiwis. Will that just happen? Do you think? Well, I think it will happen, mm. and then you can link with people overseas and do certain things. But it's definitely, I'd say, getting more and more attractive and. Mm. Yeah, you're definitely describing a you know because I think you sort of covered this point where this difference between the sort of the inventor and the entrepreneur and that I think we sometimes get that mixed up that like you're sort of saying that you know the entrepreneur like it, it's it's sort of it's, the idea is one thing but you're well, talking about all this other work that you need to do to take a product out. Yeah, so as an mm. inventor, you want your ideas to have as much impact as possible. Or I do. You know, that, that's kind of why you do it rather than just to make it something kind of yeah. cool, I think. And so part of the invention process is around that company building. But with the company building, you know, you have to 
the best company builders I've seen, they understand the detail of, you know, the marketing and the cost of customer acquisition and, you know, all the stuff yeah. that you guys, and they get excited by it and they love it, whereas that stuff, quite frankly, bores me shitless. <laughs> <laughs> and I think yeah. to be a really good entrepreneur, you have to love all of those sides and how to get yeah. the cost out and all those sorts of things. Whereas I like the creation, the early kindergarten stage. And there's lots of other people are good at the other bits, so they can do that and I'll focus on the, the bit I like, which yeah. is the... So how have you, because um, obviously, you know, you had the global brain and then you've had a bunch of other things, you know, thereafter. Mm-hmm. And global brain was, you know, made an amazing progress quite quickly, as you said. But you haven't always, it hasn't always come up roses. So how do you, how do you keep going through that? What do you sort of, you know, because you have to sort of battle on sometimes, do you, as well as... as yeah. Yeah, well, inevitably, you know, the only guaranteed way to have success is to do things that, you know, will fail along the way, really. I mean, I mean, success and failure are the same coin, really. And if you do enough, try enough things, you'll have a bit of both. And, um, yeah, and you get... You certainly get more humble as you try things. When the... I was I was this person who was you know, the first. If you if your first venture is successful, you have quite an quite an odd view of the world, and I was no different than any of that. But um, yeah, so over time you get a bit more humble about the chances of individual things happening to be a success. And sometimes when you hear the stories of people who've only done one thing and it's been successful, it actually I I ended up getting quite kind of over them you know you'd go along and they'd say oh we treat our trust customers great we've got a great culture we work really hard and i'm like well what's the alternative you don't give a shit about your customers you're lazy and you're high on morons i mean you do all that and you get lucky and there's a whole lot of other things as well so yeah because it's really interesting um you know with your different features i mean yoke bike has one like from from my sort of outside perspective i'd say you picked a problem that needed to be solved and you could and necessarily the yacht bike didn't turn out to be the solution but that solutions come in with all kinds of other solutions like you know the um motorized scooters and all kinds of things so yeah who, who th- thought the electric bikes would be a thing yeah that's right when you started <laughs> it was like amazing yeah, so you obviously saw that <laughs> there was a, a problem to be solved there you didn't for whatever reason the solution wasn't yeah. quite the fit, but well, well, I could phrase it the way Sean does, which he calls me the biggest loser he knows because you know we started search and we didn't turn into Google, and we started a, a social network and didn't turn it, and then you know, but anyway, I know he says that affectionately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you, you can't. I mean, that's one of the cool things about invention and innovation is you can't actually know for sure. Um, mm. So you do have to be happy with the ability to you know have a crack and see yeah. what works out and, and not take it too personally if it doesn't the yoke yeah. bike one is fascinating because like it's if you've driven one it's actually a really cool product and mm. it works and once you get to it and it's also from a sales point of view the most frustrating thing i've ever done because i can drive down any street in the world and people will stop and they'll come up to you and you fold it up and they go wow that is cool where can mm. i buy one but you think we could work out a way to scale mm. sales <laughs> you know yeah, it's fascinating because it was it's like you said it attracts attention people understand the proposition you know it was on the front page of time magazine all kinds of things but it's just sometimes it's hard to put your finger on yeah and what those ingredients and are. there's a lot of people tried quite hard that were cleverer than me after i left that company to try and make it work as well but you know some some things work and some things don't and that's just fine mm. that's so fine. you're sort of saying the constraint was there was something in this sort of sales uh, distribution mix you know, no well i think that one was too different like yeah. if something's too different yeah, it, yeah. and um we we'd say it was easier to learn to ride a bike than a bike but you had to learn how to do it but yeah. the thing is most adults don't want to learn how to bike, ride a bike again yeah. like they they did that when they were kids mm, yeah and so if they can't immediately get on it and ride it but most people if you give them even five minutes they'll be like wow that's kind of cool mm. but then it looks so different and it's yeah, there's a whole yeah uh, there's a whole podcast and why that didn't work yeah anyway yeah and before we, we won't dwell on that but it's interesting mm-hmm. when you look at uh say lime scooters which is just a very simple mechanical thing yep but it was actually probably the app and the network 
or yeah. wrapped around it that actually made a big difference. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it's those things that make the difference, not, it the, is. Yeah. not the core thing. Yep. Mm. Interesting. Uh, so, you know, obviously we're sort of interested in the sales and marketing part of, you know, some of these ventures and things. So, you know, what was the role of, of sales and marketing in scaling these companies? Oh, well. Well, they have not much to do with it. Well, there was this clever bloke who came along. So SLI Systems was the first um, one where we had any proper marketing people involved, and that was young Owen. Uh, Greg, actually. <laughs> no, it was just you at that stage. Yeah. Oh, well, I think it was, yeah. Anyway, the... Um, yeah, and we had, uh, what did we have, eight or nine different customers, and they're all in different markets, and it's just like, well, you just need to choose one. Where, where's the easiest cost, you know, where can you explain your benefits? So this was a, a search, this was search for, we were doing it on intranets, and we were doing it on city councils, and we were doing it on an e-customer cost, customer. And it was much easier to explain the sales proposition to that one, so it focused in on that, and then ended up being the largest software as a service e-commerce search provider and yeah. yeah but I was I only had a limited role in that that was really yep. my brother Sean ran that and a bunch of other clever people so mm. and that did have quite a I mean they they had quite a slick sales and marketing machine built up yeah, they, over time didn't they they did SLI. but but it was actually um it was actually also quite good to try and just guess customers however you could to start off with and then you could see where it gelled with it mm. and then what worked um, I always like that idea that you can try and analyze forever your sales and marketing. Or you can try a whole lot of stuff and then see what works and do more of the stuff that works and less of the stuff that doesn't. Yeah. And, and that's how you do it if in the real world, um, I think, because no one's really clever enough to know exactly mm. all the time. Yeah. yeah. And they pioneered things like content marketing too, which was not many people were doing that. You yeah. know, it's kind of stuff of giving away knowledge to to interact with prospects but they did that quite early on and, and yeah. had success yeah it was interesting yeah I mean we tend to deal with you know companies that are a bit sort of further on but definitely when we deal with sort of you know, startups or those entrepreneurs it's always about well go away and get some customers and then come back and then we've got something to sort of yeah, learn exactly. and work from yeah uh, just working from that invention is really hard oh yeah absolutely mm. so um your latest or your current venture, the Cacophony Project. You want to tell us a bit about that and um, and how that came together and where it's at and those kind of things? Yeah, so that came together as a result of the Christchurch earthquakes, which was um, just a quirky thing where I had to spend a couple. We had to spend a couple of months out in Akara after the earthquakes. And then we we're like, man, this is nice. So we moved out there and got a house, and it was um, infested with rats and stoats. Basically, they were living in the roof. And so I spent the next two or three years trying all the different sorts of trapping and I just, um, and we got rid of it. I thought the birds volume went up and then I kind of learned just how horrifically bad New Zealand's conservation is like to be one of the worst countries in the world for number of species in danger. That's pretty horrific. We're not worst at anything, let alone something as core to mm, what Is that right? I didn't realise that. And it's not because we don't care. It's not because we're, mm. um, you know, um, chopping down forests. It's just because they get being eaten. And it happens at night and you don't see it. So it's a, it is an international scale problem. And then if you looked at what the current solutions were, they were literally medieval. You know, they're basically, I call them food whackers. And they're still mostly variations on that. And so... You mean sort of mechanical traps, basically. Yeah, gin that traps, are, yeah, gin traps and yeah. snappy traps. Yeah. And, or, you know, toxins, and they've got their place as well. But, and by that stage, I'd done um, six startups, and I was like, actually, this is bloody hard work on. <laughs> How can I do something where I get to do the inventing fun part without mm. having to do all that other hard work like marketing? Although you could just hand it off to professionals. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so it's an open source project, completely charitable, non profit. And again, we chose open source because that's how a whole lot of really good mm. grunty problems are solved. Mm. And so we use thermal cameras and artificial intelligence and sound livers and innovative devices and bits. And yeah, we, uh, yeah, it looks kind of promising. It'll take a while, but you know, the goal mm. for the country is 2050. And our project's called the Cacophony Project. Um, 
And my brother's actually set up a company to make and sell the products, and he's been cheeky enough to call it 2040 because he thinks he can do it 10 years earlier. So, Because yeah. so, your sort of driving philosophy is to get... Because a lot of the other technologies are, are progressing or that other tactics are progressing, but you're trying to get a leap, basically. Yeah, so you? a lot of the other approaches are purposely saying, what's the minimum technology we can do to make it a little bit better? So can we put an automatic feeder on it or can we reset a trap or can we... Whereas I'm a big believer in Moore's Law and so stuff that sounds like sci-fi, like you know thermal cameras and artificial intelligence, and you know it sounds like well, it's going to be way too expensive. But if you can design something with IT and it can identify, lure, and kill it, everything in an area, then you don't need to leave it there, and you can move it through. And then over time, that's just going to get cheaper and cheaper. Whereas a snap device is not going to get cheaper and better. Mm. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the philosophy. And it's quite a nice origin story on your name too, isn't there? The cacophony side of it. Yeah, well, I purposely didn't want it to be about um, killing things because when Captain Cook got here and, you know, there was a cacophony of birdsong. And if you've ever been to a sanctuary, there's a cacophony of birdsong. So we want to get that birdsong back. And that's what, what it's about. And it's actually, unlike a lot of environmental problems, it's actually, we understand what you do. If you get rid of the predators, the birds bounce back. And the birds are just a high level indicator in all the insects and fauna and bits and pieces. And so. You know, I'm hoping that by the time it seems inevitable that tech can solve this because, you know, there's people who worry about artificial intelligence taking over the world and, you know, mm. and then, but some people are just pessimistic because they'll go, but you'll never be able to catch rats. And I'm like, well, hang yeah, on, that's on. not very consistent. <laughs> Which one is it? Because <laughs> you can't have one without the other, really. But yeah, um, yeah so it's quite fun, actually. And are they is, is are the cacophony products that like they're being yeah used commercially yet or yeah. are they sort of on their life cycle? Yeah, so we've got a bird monitor that monitors. It's a basically a modified uh, cell phone that can measure if your bird volume is going up or down, and we've got a, th- uh, a thermal camera so you can see exactly what's happening with predators, and that's being sold commercially. And we've started to have a, a high catch rate trap because most of the traps. W- when you go out and you first start to trap pretty much everything works you know you'll catch a whole lot of stuff with pretty much everything and everyone gets encouraged and goes oh well we just get more of these and put them out but when you get rid of a a number of the population you've got a a resident population that doesn't like sticking their head in traps um, or certain baits or whatever it happens to be so we've because we the reason we developed the thermal camera is that the standard method they have is either tracking tunnel, tunnels and chew cards or they have a trail cam, but that trail cam is designed for pigs and deer. And so it doesn't catch fast moving little predators. So we thought there was a lot happening that we weren't seeing, but we're seeing about 10 times as much with this thermal camera. Wow. And so you can put your camera in front of a standard trap and it has a catch rate of about 1%. So most animals are just walking through the forest, not going up every tree. But man, it's hard to explain that to the industry. We're mm. not very popular. <laughs> but it, it's kind of fascinating because... Why would you be not popular if you come up with a really good answer that's going to help them? No, well, at the moment we've mostly shown why we're not doing incremental things on something up a tree because animals walk past it. But your natural thing is to automate something that's up a tree or put an automatic feeder on it or make yeah. it slightly better. But our whole thing, is, and so most of those are the sorts of things that are being funded because it's an incremental little improvement. And yeah, it saves a bit on labour, but it's never going to get you to zero. And the big advantage of getting to zero is you don't have to keep doing it. Um, and so you can mm. protect it forever. And and it's a harder problem, but we, you know, see it just seems inevitable that it'll be solved through, you know, the high tech approach. So. Mm. And so this is a vision for New Zealand for the moment, or is, it, is there... Because it's an international problem, obviously, so is there a broader... Well, it's the biggest problem for countries like New Zealand and Australia to a, as, as well. Uh, it's mm. where you've had um, introduced predator, mm. mammalian predators. So um, it really is New Zealand is probably the worst place for it. Um, but, yeah, there's certainly the Australians and a bunch of other mm. um, islands and things are interested. Mm. But it, it's kind of... I was a bit shocked when I learned that we've got a larger proportion mm. of our species in danger than somewhere like Africa. Mm. And you're like, it's not your perception of how things are. It's not yeah, very I suppose common. it's sort of connected because there was 
nothing here before that could harm anything. So yeah, so anything's a predator. Well, well you know, it's a, it evolved over seventy million years, so that you know there was no ground place mammals. So you know they stop and are still and and they just get eaten, mm. and it's uh yeah, not very cool. It's a tough life. Hey, um, well, just as we as we bring things into land, um, it'd be really good. Maybe if you've had, uh, you know, if inventors, entrepreneurs are out there. What, what what would be you've been through so many ventures and so many experiences? Any sort of would you distill things down to a few few key points they need to think about? Um, I think it's just you have to ask lots of different people what's going on. The more people, and lots of people will give you a, a few minutes to have a conversation. Mm. And then what you find is a lot of people will tell you completely different things. You have to get IP, IP is a waste of time. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And, and there is no correct answer. And so anyone who mm. tells you for sure there's a correct answer is wrong. And your job is to get as much advice as you can and then apply it to your particular problem. And then if it doesn't work, try something else and keep doing that until you kind of hone in on something so it's sort of um and it, this is probably as, as your your brother sean is similar it's sort of high low low um uh, it's more about um, a lot of curiosity and low ego i suppose is it? it's the combination of i don't you know yeah. i'm not the i don't know everything and i'm really curious about how to find the solution yeah and i think that's that's the most honest approach so you will get people who I call proclaimers, they, they just come in and they go, I know I've done this before, I know for sure, and they've fist. And that sounds way more convincing than someone who goes, well, it's kind of complicated. It depends a bit on this and a yeah. bit on that. And inevitably the nuanced is the more accurate answer, but it doesn't sound as convincing. Um, and it's not often as convincing, but it's, I mean, the world's a complicated place. Yeah. And when with hindsight, you can say, the reason you know this succeeded was because of this and this and this, but there's a lot going on, and um, but it's way more fun than a normal job. I think <laughs> I'm completely unemployable. I, just, I don't know how I'd cope with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey um, Grant, that's been lots of fun. We could do it all day, but um, we need, you need to get back over the hill to your beautiful place in Akara. Um, but we really enjoyed the chat, and, and thanks for your time, and all the best with uh, all your ventures, but uh, particularly Cacophony Project. Cool. Nice chatting, chaps. Yeah, thank you. Kia ora. Well, Greg, that was a great chat with uh, Grant R- Ryan. Uh, what do you th- reflecting on that conversation? What, what do you sort of see as the themes or the insights we got out, out of that today? Oh, it's fascinating, really. I mean, he's a such a humble guy for the amount of stuff he's achieved over his lifetime. But um, I just love the the fact that he was so open, and you know, it's all about being curious and trying to uh, understand the best way to take your ideas to to market yeah um that's what i think you know he, he sort of laid bare that whole fallacy of the of the the tech entrepreneur that just knows all the answers to everything um so he said it's more about that trying to solve that problem come up with that idea and then then learning from everybody else to to get it there yeah i sort of felt it was a really good uh story around that you know, almost the difference between an inventor and this innovator and, you know, how the end customer that they sold stuff to, even if it was just a selling of the IP, they didn't they didn't want an idea. He had to sort of almost evolve it into a business and start working on all the details, mm-hmm. get some customers, you know, to be able to package it up for, a, for an end customer. Yeah, it's pretty hard work. And the other, the other thing I took was, um, you know, he had this insight that, that Early on, you just need to get out and try stuff. Yeah. Try to sell your, your what you come up with to different people, and try lots of tactics in terms of marketing and selling and packaging and whatever, and and sort of work out. Be really conscious about what might work, and then put your focus on, yeah, and really concentrate on that. And I think that, that winner. One other for me was you know this sort of um, getting advice from everybody, and really sort of understanding that it's very complicated there's lots of different situations and what worked last time might not work this time you know if it was if it was formulaic there would be a book that would all just start at chapter one and would all be millionaires it's obviously more complicated than that so get advice as much as you can keep talking to everybody and you know rip into it basically and the last thing um from me was 
you know, the the fact that he's got this cacophony project and the brilliance of it is that he, the whole thing's named around the benefit of of yeah, that. It's not about predator killing machines yeah. or yeah. it's all about what can we create as a as the the beneficial outcome so i'd recommend anybody go and look at cacophony project you can google it there's a website and social media channels and you can get involved um you know and just just learn more about it so that that's it for today um we'll look forward to pod number three coming up soon i've uh, got a great guest lined up can't quite unveil who that is yet um, but we will do in advance and um, look forward to um, entertaining you all then with another great story from the tech industry. Thanks. Mm-hmm.